This episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast with Caleb Kaltenbach is presented by our brand new Sports Spectrum Weekly Slant football show that is available and out now. It premiered back in September, and it's every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, on our YouTube, our Facebook, and our website, sportsspectrum.com. We're doing a show that I've been searching around. I can't find another show like this. A football show, there's plenty of those, but a football show that brings Jesus into the conversation. So important these days, especially with what we do at Sports Spectrum, to make sure we don't leave Jesus out of the conversation. We want to bring him back. We want to keep him in the conversation. And that means the football conversation, which is probably the most popular sport out there, especially right now in the fall. And Sports Spectrum's Weekly Slant is a brand new show that we want to have you guys check out every single week. We have three different hosts, myself, Brock Heward from Fox Sports, and Jade McCarthy, formerly of ESPN, host of Sports Center. Us three are going to be bringing you different conversations every single week. You need to go check it out. Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook, our YouTube, and of course at sportspectrum.com. It's faith, it's football, it's Sports Spectrum's Weekly Slant. Make sure you tune in every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern at sportspectrum.com. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, where we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. And welcome, everyone, to the show. I am Jason. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Make sure you check out our website, sportspectrum.com, for all of our free content, devotionals, articles, stories, podcasts, testimonials, all available, like I said, for free at sportspectrum.com. When you're there, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter. Click the subscribe button, that newsletter icon at the top of the website, and you're good to go. Put your email address in, and you'll receive our weekly Sports Spectrum email, which just keeps you up to date on all the happenings going on at Sports Spectrum. Today on the show, we have a really awesome conversation with Caleb Kaltenbach, and it's kind of two conversations here. Caleb, just for a little background, is an author, a pastor. He's executive director of the Messy Grace Group. He was raised by three activist gay parents, and since becoming a follower of Christ, has made it his mission to develop influence with the LGBTQ community without sacrificing theological convictions. Caleb is also a good friend of mine, a diehard Kansas City Chiefs fan, a diehard Star Wars fan, and a huge Marvel fan as well. He's a husband and a dad to two kids. And this conversation kind of goes in two different circles. The beginning, the first half of this conversation We spend time talking about football, we spend time talking about Star Wars, we spend time talking about Marvel. So if you're not interested in either of those three things, I understand, you can fast forward till about halfway, and then we get into a conversation about his brand new book. It's called Messy Truth, How to Foster Community Without Sacrificing Conviction. We do talk about what that is like, fostering community with the LGBTQ environment without sacrificing conviction. This is a powerful conversation, an important conversation. Let's take a listen to Caleb Kaltenbach, author and speaker, the new book called Messy Truth. Caleb joins us here on Sports Spectrum. Caleb Kaltenbach, buddy. So good to see you. Welcome to Sports Spectrum. Man, thank you for having me. It's great to be here, and I love, 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 love. The shout out to the Chiefs there. I have to give a shout out to the Chiefs. Actually, that's where I wanted to start with sports because you've been a little spoiled uh, these last three or four seasons, I guess. Um, really, since Andy Reid came into the picture, I was looking at their their history since Andy Reid came on board, and I don't think they've won less than 10 games. I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what I saw. And when you throw two Super Bowl appearances, a Super Bowl championship, um, it's a pretty good time to be a Chiefs fan, I'd say. It is. It is. We have been spoiled, but not when you compare all the previous years of the Chiefs in existence. Now, we had some good runs when, you know, you had Derek Thomas, Marcus Allen, Joe Montana, and I live out in L.A., so they're actually, 
when I first moved here, I was shocked at how many Chiefs fans were in Los Angeles. Mm. But then it made sense because when Montana made that move, a lot of people kind of switched their allegiance and a lot of people just stuck with the Chiefs out here. Yeah. They didn't go back. So um, I guess that makes sense. But yeah, uh, the, the last, I mean, couple of years have been amazing. And dude, who doesn't love to watch Mahomes play? I mean, even people that don't like the Chiefs like Mahomes. It was shocking to me that he didn't win the Super Bowl last year. It was shocking that, not shocking, I should say, to, to watch him compete still, even when you guys were losing by a lot at the end. And st- and he was playing with, what, a busted toe and just injuries and a messed up offensive line. And yet he was still impressing. When you watched it, you were like, this guy's just built differently. He's just different. So you're spoiled, man. And he's only, what, 25, 26? I mean, oh, you got him. Yeah. you're going to have him for a while. So. Yeah, and I think his dad really invested a lot of character traits into him when he was yeah. raising him, which is good. But I tell you what, the game um, back in uh, when was it? I think it was Jan. I think it was January twenty twenty. I think. Okay. Yeah, twenty twenty. The game that really just I had about five aneurysms was when they were playing the Oilers. You um, mean the Texans? In the, yeah. Yeah, the Texans. Sorry, gosh, yes. the Oilers, the Texans, and dude. By like near the end of the first quarter, they were it's 24 zero to 28, 24. Yeah. 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 And I just, I was getting texts. I was getting trash talked by my friends and I've already had three aneurysms, you know, and oh. I'm talking to an inanimate object, the TV yelling right. at it. Of course. Um, and then like a couple of my friends are like, just wait and see, just hold on. And dude, that was the most insane game. And like it happened he, so quick, like it was 24 nothing Houston and you blinked and you turned around and it was 28, 24 Kansas city. And it's amazing too, because that just shows you how quickly momentum works when mm-hmm. a team has momentum, they can take off, man. It's well, like uh, one, when you're favorite. an unstoppable offense too, that helps. I think it, well, you know, their, it helps their defense got, you know, a little caught off guard, but that was, you always look at when you win a super bowl, like what are the turning points? What are the moments? That was one of, I mean, three moments. They were down to Tennessee in the championship game, 17 nothing, and they were down by 10 in the fourth quarter against San Francisco in the Super Bowl and came back and won. So maybe they were just built differently to know that as long as we're close, we can turn it around and respond pretty quickly. It's an impressive team to watch, man. You you must have really high expectations for the team this year, I would imagine. No, I I do, and I try not to because I always got to remember the psychology factor of the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. In the past, they've gotten so far, and then something happens, and the psychology factor breaks in. And then, so yeah, yeah. I'm really hoping that doesn't happen this time. But well, as long yeah. as there's no injuries, right? As long as there's no injuries. Well, yeah, and and it would help if we do go to the Super Bowl again. It would help if uh, the rest of the team showed up with Mahomes to play. <laughs> that would be great. Fantastic. I want to ask you that: is can you can you enjoy after the game's over? Obviously, a season like last year where you go all the way and you have all the expectations and you won the year before, I think you were favored. I know I picked the chiefs thinking the chiefs were going to win. Even if the game was in Tampa, I thought the chiefs were going to win. I thought their offense was just too much and too hard to stop, but can you enjoy that? Can you look back at last year and be like, yeah, we made the super bowl, even though we didn't win. Yeah. Because we were better than everybody else other than Tampa. Right. Okay. Just you make it sure. Because it. a lot of fans. You still enjoy it. Yeah. A no. lot of fans cannot. I mean, would you rather, that's what I was going to ask too, is would you rather not have been in last year's Super Bowl or get there and lose coming off of what you did the year before, not get there and lose? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. clearly you want to go even if you're going to lose. Oh, I had somebody, I had a Cowboys fan trash talking me. And it wasn't me, I promise. No, 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 I know it wasn't you, but I was just like, oh, that man, I, I love hearing you talk. First of all, it's just made my day. Um, anytime I can hear about Jerry Jones, my day is improved. Let me put uh, this in perspective for Cowboy fans, and I love the Cowboys. I always will. <laughs> yeah. They haven't been to a Super Bowl since this, the year that Pat Mahomes Jr. was born. Patrick Mahomes was born in September of 95, I believe. That was the year the Cowboys last went to a Super Bowl. So I'm not saying, I'm just saying. It's been a long time, and we have nothing to say to any other team. It's nothing. been a long time coming. and <laughs> And so – this guy Someday. kept on talking, talking, talking. Yeah. And I'm like, so where, where was your team in the Super Bowl? I have to haven't been for a long time. I was 21 wow. years old the last time they were there. Yeah. 22 years I, old. I had a Raiders fan trash talking to me too. Nope, that doesn't work Bowl, either. Like, oh, your your team did really well. <laughs> me. And I'm like, really? Where where 
where were the Raiders? Yeah. yeah. Like, Whoa, weird, weird things going on. Oh, but but you weren't in the Super Bowl. Yeah, you can't Just double trash checking. talk. When the teams get to the Super Bowl, you can root for your, which team you want. You can, um, you know, be happy. If it, I mean, I was looking for Tampa as a team just because of a couple of guys that I knew on their team to do well. But I also knew Steph Wisniewski and I wanted him to do well with Kansas City. So I was watching it. But I would never text someone and say, hey, your team stinks. What are you doing? Especially when your team's not there. If you're a yeah. Tampa Bay fan, sure. Text yeah. all you want to Caleb and all the other Chiefs fans. But every other team has to just kind of yeah. put that phone away. And I, and I was happy for Tampa Bay. I really was. Yeah. Um, you know, it. even though I would have loved to see the rest of the Chiefs show up because you look at Mahomes, dude, that guy was tired by the end of the first quarter. That guy was exhausted already. Right, he was done. Yeah, he was running around like crazy. Um, and it's like, and, and again, I know there were things that happened leading up to that week, even the, the car wreck and, you know, yeah. with Andy Reid's son and just the unfortunate A lot of situation there. And, yeah. you know, I get that. I get that message with people, but still, come on. I know. Anyway. I know. Well, now it gets you itching to get back. I remember in the 90s as a Cowboys fan, they won in 92, 93. They lost in the championship game to San Francisco in 94, and they got back in 95. And I'm like, just let me get one more. And it's been 26 years. So um, I know what it's like, though, and I know how hard it is to get there. So to be able to play in three straight championship games and two Super Bowls, as I tell a lot of Chiefs fans, like, just just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. I did want to ask you one question about Mahomes. This is a little controversial. Um, is he the greatest Kansas City Chief of all time right now? Yeah. Like, if he didn't play another game, is he? do you think he's the, the best Chief of all time? They got a lot of history, a lot of great players that played there. But is he? The, I mean, he he's getting close to it already at twenty six. What do you think? If he's not there, he's already he's close to it. I think there are a lot of other really good Chiefs players. Like Derek Thomas maybe is the Derek Thomas. Is? Yeah, Derek Thomas and I don't know. Yeah. Some of the longevity of some of the guys that, are, that have been there. Um, you know, and you know, obviously Marcus Allen was great, and you know, but Allen and you know. Uh, Joe Montana, they were both there for shorter amounts of time. But, exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. But like somebody like Derek Thomas is that's different. But um, I think Mahomes, if he's not there, he's going to be there sooner rather than later. I think if he takes the team to the Super Bowl this year, heck, even the championship game this year, I think he I think he is. I think he's the greatest chief of all time. As long as he plays a, a regular full season and does well, like he's like he's expected to. I think he's the best chief of all time, which is pretty impressive when you think this is a franchise that's been around for 50 plus, 60 plus years. So, no, 100. You know, yeah, I think incredible. I think, watch. The, I think the only thing that would make the Chiefs better, personally, in my in my personal opinion, yeah. um, is that, you know, the only coach I think could do a, a better job uh, would be Palpatine. <laughs> Is this like a segue into into Star Wars that you're just doing right there? You did. You, oh, you noticed the transition? I did. Well done. <laughs> well done. See, this is what I wanted to do. Let me let me let me paint the picture here for our audience who may not know the fact that Caleb and I not only are friends but we have kindred spirits. So we both love football, obviously. And we spent time talking about the Chiefs there. We both love Star Wars. And just to give people a little background on, on Caleb and I, so I met him, I'm, I'm sure it was social media somewhere, but we started talking 2015 or so, and you had heard a message that I shared on forgiveness. We set up a call. I remember still being at ESPN. Mike and Mike had just ended 2016. I go out to the parking lot and I talk with you and you said, dude, I heard your story. You need to write a book. And I laughed at you. I tell people this story all the time because I never had any desire to ever write a book, but you encouraged me. You introduced me to your literary agent, had a conversation with him, started to map out some, some directions on what a forgiveness book would look like. And then two years later, Live to Forgive was born. And I, I credit you. I mean, there's a lot of people that helped me along the way, certainly, but I credit you because you were the first person to really introduce that idea for me to write a book. But then as we got to know each other a little bit, I'm like, Oh, he loves Star Wars. We got to start talking about Star Wars a little bit. He loves the NFL too. But so let's let's go a little geek, a geek world here with our Star Wars love. If people want to fast forward like five minutes here, um, I completely understand if they don't like Star Wars. We're gonna get to some really deep stuff in a minute about your new book, Re Messy Truth. But if I if I have you on and we don't talk Star Wars, I feel like I'm doing a disservice 
to you and me as our yeah. as friendship, totally. as a friendship goes. So I'm just going to ask a couple random questions. You can go as long or short as you, as you want with them. Earliest Star Wars memory. Earliest Star Wars memory is seeing Empire Strikes Back in the movie theater as a kid. Okay. Wow. Same here. That's the earliest. Yes. Earliest I can remember. Second earliest was getting one of those. Uh, what I also saw Return of the Jedi. I remember that a lot more clearly. Same here. But also going to Walmart or Kmart. I think it was Kmart back in the day and getting one of the lightsabers. You know, there was just like a long kind of pole that was hollow and you swung it and it kind of made the weird noise. Yeah. Um, not like the retractable lightsabers today where it's just like. Wow. It's so much better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like, that's incredible. So did you remember so, buying uh, a star Wars figure and in, in the box or on the, 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 the cardboard, you would save the proof of purchase and send it in to like get a Boba Fett or a Palpatine or mm -hmm. I forget who else, maybe um, Anakin, old yeah. Anakin. Do you remember? Do, did you do that? Oh yeah. I did that. I did that. I did that for old Anakin specifically. I remember when that character came out, yeah. unfortunately, at the time as a kid, you're just playing rough housing and everything. And now I don't even know where it is. So I'm just like, ah, ah, do you have you anything know? from your childhood, like Star Wars stuff? I found my, my Millennium Falcon, like the big plastic Millennium Falcon from when I was like seven years old. It's in, I mean, I would say it's average condition. It's been used. Let's put it that way. But I kept it. I was like, I want to have this for the rest of my life to remind me of being eight years old. Do you have anything from when you were, you were a little kid? So I know you're going to feel my pain here. Um, and you'll understand this because you're an expert on forgiveness. You wrote on it. So <laughs> my mom threw all my Star Wars toys away. Oh, no. Ewok yeah. Village, Millennium Falcon, ad -AT. Back in the day, we called them ad -ATs, not at not right? right? But yeah. ad um, I just All your figures? Oh, yes. And oh. It, she, she did that. And I immediately felt righteous indignation. I'm like, how could you? I, I would rather oh you gosh. cut off my pinky finger. Right. How I old never were you when you it. found out that she threw them away? Were you older? I was in my 20s. Oh. Live to forgive, Caleb. Live to forgive. No, no, I know. And, you know, oh. my wife my wife has family in the cartels out here. So I thought, thought about that as an option, you know. <laughs> Um, but then oh I'm like, my you gosh, know, bro, that's so hard. That's no, hard. It, it was difficult. That was, that was just, and I mean, all, all my toys, Voltron, if you remember that Voltron, sure. I even yeah. had, you know, I'm wearing my Cobra Kai shirt. I even had uh karate, like action figures, karate kid action figures. I had yes. chosen, I had Mr. Miyagi. I had Daniel, I even had Johnny. And I'm like, how cool would it be to have Johnny Lawrence action figure from the eighties right now? Oh my gosh. Like, yeah gone well you don't think they're ever going to reboot a show from when we're you know kids and now bring it back into the you know when our 40s now trying to watch this stuff i mean by the way i'm not diverting too much but cobra kai is awesome isn't oh, it? it's fantastic you know uh, i think season four comes out november december and then they yeah. just renewed it for season five yeah they're, i think that's probably the ceiling like i don't know if they can keep making like 10 or 12 of these here like go about five no. and then you're done yeah no exactly you gotta know when to cut it off at a good point it's kind of like the office yes they should have ended like when the, once once michael left, left and they tried to continue it that was not a good idea yeah. no no it wasn't and i the writing is just so on point yeah you know with every episode in yeah. cover Kai. but it's like really good. Yeah. i felt that way about the mandalorian like i'm personally glad they ended it at season two like it was and i'm looking forward to the book about boba fett but Mandalorian was money. That was Perfect. phenomenal. Is it the best thing that Star Wars has done since Return of the Jedi? That's kind it's, of how I'm thinking here. It's 100% the best thing. And the second best thing up until that point where I would say the best thing would have been Rogue One since yeah. the original trilogy. Like I love Rogue One. Um, the Last Jedi was just... <laughs> You have such you a know, hatred for that movie, don't you? That's the second in the in the most recent three movies, right? Okay. So I think we can both agree that Rise of Skywalker was awful, but hopefully, maybe not. I, I, I wouldn't say awful. I thought it was okay. It was okay. But I will tell you this. Seeing the end of Mandalorian, the, the finale, and I'm going to mm -hmm. give it away. If you haven't seen the finale yet, that's your fault. Yeah. You've had plenty Skywalker of Skywalker returns. Comes back. Yeah. Yes. 
that helped me to like The Last Jedi more. And I'll tell you why. Because in The Return of the Jedi, you have Luke and he's such an optimistic character. He's like, I'm going to turn my father or I'm going to die trying. That's mm-hmm. how much I love my father. I believe in who he can be. And then you get to Last Jedi and you have homeless Nick Nolte running along around a castaway island, milking a lactating alien sea moose. Yeah. And it's like, shock. What? Yeah. But this is what happened to our Luke Skywalker. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, there are other things like the casino planet, saving the animals, leaving the children in slavery. That obviously is an issue. But um, when I was able to see Luke and get a little bit more of his history, believe it or not, that kind of helped me to like The Last Jedi a little bit more. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense or not. But it went from really like, bad to, j- to just, you know, so just bad. bad. Yeah. Yeah. Just because bad. I felt like there's a huge gap that we don't know anything about. And yeah. the Mandalorian finale kind of bridged it a little bit. Yeah. You know? I thought the Mandalorian that was helped. so good. That was the perfect way to, to bring star Wars back to have it be familiar, but to tell new stories. Oh yeah. Right. And they, they, yeah. And they did a great job of bringing in uh, all three trilogies and then mm-hmm. rebels and then um, clone wars. All of it. They just brought all of it in. And um, I loved Ahsoka. I love. I, I know they're doing an Ahsoka. I can't wait for that. Yeah. I can't My wait for Boba character. Fett. Yeah. So oh, that's going to be great. I I just there's so many things I'm looking forward to. Of course, right now I'm in my Marvel fanboy kind of era after Loki, which was just phenomenal. All the three shows that they've done have been phenomenal. And then right now, as we're recording this, you know, midnight tonight, Shang Chi comes out. Yes. And I can't wait for that. So I'm 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 happy with Marvel right in now. In about three hours, I'm going to a movie theater to see it. So that tells you um, that I'm seeing it as well. I will say this. I was not a Marvel kid at all. I didn't read comics. I didn't um, I didn't get into any of the characters. I would have heard of Captain America, obviously. Maybe Iron Man. Didn't know any of the other. Maybe the Incredible Hulk, of course. Um, but I didn't know marvel until i got to my 40s and i started watching the movies and they are amazing i'm a guy like during the pandemic i rewatched the entire thing like three times i've watched um endgame which i think is the best of, of the series a lot of people disagree with one me. of the best superhero movies ever I think. I think it's i think it might be the best but that's a, an argument we can have another time but i think that movie i probably have watched three times it's a three-hour movie and i and watched a- it during the pandemic the full movie three times it was that good and it's surprising how emotional you get, even in your 40s when you're watching it. Right. Especially like when, when you start to understand the characters and the backstory and how they're all connected, which when I first saw Iron Man in 2008, um, it, I thought it was a good movie, but I didn't understand what it was setting up uh, in this universe here. Uh, even when Nick Fury came at the very end of the first Iron Man, I, I didn't get it. I heard a I, whole crowd of people in the, in the audience were clapping and I'm like, why is are they clapping no. for Samuel L. Jackson? I don't I don't understand this. Because growing yeah. up, I was more Super Friends, DC Comics. I was yes, more same here. I love Star Superman. Wars. Obviously, my yeah. idea my idea of Superman is still Christopher Reeve. Absolutely. I remember being so excited when Batman was coming out, and I'm like, Michael Keaton, Mister mm-hmm. Mom, are you kidding? But then I saw the movie. I'm like, wow, he did a phenomenal job. Yeah. And so like that's where I come from, and then. You had Batman v Superman, and it's like, yeah, they kind of, they kind of. I mean, I thought Wonder Woman was really, really good, but then even oh, I the, did second, too. the second one was was not very good. Wonder Woman nineteen ninety four. I wrote so a whole like, blog on that. Yeah, did you? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, this is what we'll do. I'm going to stop here because I want people <laughs> to understand. I don't know. We're 20 minutes into this thing that uh, there's a whole other conversation that needs to be had that I want people to listen to. So if you don't like Star Wars or you know, any of this superhero stuff, this is the point now where you can start to listen and say, okay, we're going to move into some messy grace, messy truth type of conversation here and learn Caleb's story because it's a powerful one. So um, I appreciate you, buddy. We should just do a whole nother podcast on Star Wars and super. And even if it doesn't air on Sports Spectrum, we'll just post it on blogs or something because we can go for hours about this stuff, which we, we will and hopefully should at some point. Caleb Kaltenbach is our guest here on Sports Spectrum, and his new book is called Messy Truth, How to Foster Community Without Sacrificing Conviction. 
Um, Messy Truth, the, the prelude to that, I guess, the first book for that was Messy Grace. Um, and for those listening that don't know your background, and I, I want people to read that book, Messy Grace, to learn more. But can we start with you giving us a little bit of a snapshot of your upbringing, Caleb, because it's so important to your story and uh, really how you came to follow Christ? Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Columbia, Missouri in Kansas City. Uh, when I was two, my parents taught at different universities and schools. When I was two, my parents divorced. Both of them went into same-sex relationships. My dad had several friends, but my mom was in a two, uh, 22-year relationship with a woman named Vera, who was a psychologist. They moved to Kansas City. They were together until Vera died of cancer um, in 2005, February 2005. So, mm. um, And they were activist-oriented. So I grew up uh, preschool, elementary age, middle school, going with them to LGBTQ parties, clubs, bars, pride parades, campouts. Um, and, and that's where I really developed kind of a, I, I would almost say a hatred for Christians, just in uh, seeing uh, so-called believers hold up signs saying God hates you, Yeah. turn or burn. I saw people throw water and urine on people in parades. I saw families ignoring their young sons dying of AIDS in the 1980s. Mm. And here's what I thought, Jason, that I never want to be a Christian because uh, if Christians are this bad and Jesus is their leader, I can't imagine how awful he must be. Right, right. Yeah. And so I, I ended up when I was 16, joining a Bible study to learn how to disprove Christianity. And as you can tell, that worked out real well. It's a great plan. Great plan. Love it when a plan comes together. That's and right. that plan yes. never came together. But um, I started studying what the Bible had to say about sexuality. And I changed my view of marriage, relationship, sexuality to the view that I hold today, which is the historic uh, Judeo-Christian view of marriage and relationships. And mm -hmm. um, then at the age of 16, I had to come out to my three gay parents as a Christian. They ended up kicking me out for a while. And then after that, um, they let me back in. I went to Bible college, got married. Believe it or not, my wife is much more beautiful than I am. It was hard to find somebody that was more eye candy. But I did. yeah, I'm I'm shocked at that. You know, to be honest yeah, with you, it's, it's it's it was it was a trial, but we found it. So yeah. anyway, we have two kids. Joel's now 14. Rachel's now 12. But uh, in 2010, we moved to Dallas, Texas. I was preaching there for about three and a half years before we moved back to Southern California. And while I was there, my parents started uh, came down and moved to Dallas to be closer to our family. They started attending the church that I was preaching at, even though they knew what I believed and the people in this church really came around them and loved them and treated them like people, not like projects. Mm. And in the summer of 2013, at the ages of 69, 70, my mom and dad gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Wow. I so, love hearing that story. And you wrote about yeah. that in Messy Grace. It's an amazing story. Um, are your parents still around? Or are they still here? Are they still with us? Yeah. Um, my dad has uh, dementia that's been turning into Alzheimer's. Um, mm. So that's difficult. Yeah. Uh, but my mom also, uh, she still lives in Dallas. I usually go see her about once a month and she has, um, uh, just a lot of different problems. She's going through cancer again for the second time. She's got heart problems. And so they're both in assisted living. Uh, but I try to go see her once a month. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're, they're still around. But they both gave their lives to Christ after they living. both gave their lives to Christ. It's incredible. It's an incredible story. Do you, I mean, do you, have you talked to them? What was it that, especially at that age? I mean, people say it's hard once you get past what 15, 16 to give your life to Christ because you're set sort of in your ways. Um, and I, I gave my life to Christ at 27. So I was a little older, but 69 and 70 after the life that they lived. Holy cow. It's an amazing story. Yeah, I think what did it and what they said was people treated them like people, not like projects. And I think a lot of times as Christians, um, we get occupied by things like theology or ethics or social issues or philosophy. And all those things are really important. Yeah. But I think, you know, that sometimes we forget that the context of our life takes place in relationships and God designed us for relationships. And really what did it was relationships, community, um, people saying, Hey, yeah, I, I don't agree with your theology or idea of this, but 
that doesn't demean my view of you as an individual or the intrinsic value that I think God has assigned to you because you're made in his image and likeness. And um, it's amazing what can happen when you have a good community, a loving community that really values grace and truth both. Yeah. Um, grace and truth, two words. The first book you wrote was messy grace, um, mm -hmm. which I loved. I still tell people they need to read it. And if they're having questions about these type of topics and discussions, like read messy grace, I think I'm going to start referencing your new book, messy truth as well, because I think that's more of a book that can be practical for the church to kind of implement, to have these conversations and how to handle and how to respond to different conversations in this realm. Um, this book, I think, Caleb is really needed in the church, messy truth. And it's out now. People need to go get it. Um, especially for those who identify as Christ followers, because I feel like, and you even kind of alluded to it, we failed in many ways as believers to follow the commands of Christ by simply loving our neighbor as ourself. Um, I think we failed in so many ways to look at people with intrinsic value, those that agree, those that look different, those that you know, affirm different, those that, you know, whatever it is, we don't do this well. And we should be the ones that are doing it the best. As I say, when I'm talking about Christ followers, um, talk about this book. Why, why is it, why this book right now, I guess? Yeah, I think this book right now, because the whole conversation about uh, sexuality, LGBTQ, people who relate or identify as sexual minorities, that's not going away. If anything, it's heating up. Um, sure. and so for me, I describe it this way, messy grace has a lot of my story in it, but it's also for people on how do you love your LGBTQ friends and family, like your personal relationships. And to me, messy truth is more about community. Like how do you get your LGBTQ friends and family, uh, interested, connected to a Christ centered community? Um, what does that look like? Uh, it's really divided into three parts. Uh, you know, the book, the first part is all about uh, convictions. The second part is about compassion. The third part is about conversations mm -hmm. because that's when truth feels messy. And just like grace, grace and truth are actually not messy. They're not at all. Like I, I tell, you know, I've even had, uh, you know, people from all different denominations, even people who haven't read the book say, well, uh, the only thing I don't like about it is the title. You're saying that grace and truth are messy. I'm like, no, I'm not. To God, there is no tension between grace and truth. He is sovereign. He's timeless. He understands it perfectly. He has a plan that's being carried out, even if we don't feel like it. But for us who are sinful, broken people, even though we're saved, you know, we still live in this arena of time with yeah. experiencing the progression of days. And so to us, we'll always feel tension between grace and truth. And it will always seem messy because we filter it through our sinful minds and we have to realize that you know even though it feels and looks messy it's not and we need to embrace the messy and look past our feelings when it comes to that this book as i'm reading it there's a wonderful um story about rachel in chapter six and i don't want to give away all the book obviously we want people to go buy the book but i do think the story of rachel kind of paints a nice snapshot of not only where the book is going and what the book's about, but really just acknowledging other people's experiences, the importance of acknowledging other people's experience in how we can go about loving our neighbor and those in our church that are from the LGBTQ community. Can you tell the story of Rachel a little bit and share that with our audience? Yeah. So Rachel is one of my good friends and she had read Messy Grace and uh, she'd been in a relationship with another woman. Um, and I think they were married. I, they were, uh, they ended up, you know, splitting apart. Um, she started attending uh, her church and really, really got involved. And the pastor really came around her alongside her and helped her. Uh, her pastor, uh, Brian Mills, is just a phenomenal leader, phenomenal pastor. I love that guy. And um, she had read Messy Grace. They read it together. And I was in Springfield, Illinois, where Rachel was, and Rachel and Brian and I actually got together at a coffee shop, and I heard her story, and, you know, it was still really fresh, it was still really raw, and she was still um, asking a lot of questions, which she's still asking questions, which you and I are still asking questions, I mean, that, sure. that's part of what we do throughout our growth and our sanctification, um, but at the same time, 
you know, I could tell that she had such a love for God, such a commitment, and really, she took things seriously. And so, um, you know, just looking at someone like Rachel, unfortunately, if she were to go to some churches, people would make snap judgments about her. They would automatically say, okay, bang, you know, this person right here, you know, obviously I know who she is, I know what she thinks, and so on and so forth. And I think some of that is because our mind naturally is wired to make quick judgments. We make something like 35,000 decisions in one day or more even. Yeah. And our mind, you know, is used to putting every decision on autopilot. So it doesn't have to do a lot. And so that's why I think it takes, besides our sinfulness, uh, the way our mind works, that's why it takes so much intentionality for us to think deeper about people, not differently about theology. And we have to be intentional. And so, you know, when I think about Rachel, and I really tie that to the chapter of acknowledgement, you see, I think there's a difference between acceptance and agreement. That mm-hmm. we're commanded by God to accept people no matter what. And that means loving them where they're at. You know, it's Matthew 5, 38 through 48. You know, you've heard it was said, love your enemy. I tell you, no, you, you hate your enemy. You love your enemy. You pray for those who, who persecute you. It's Matthew 22, 37 through 40. You know, love God, love people. Um, it's what Paul says in Romans 13, 8 through 10, that loving your neighbor fulfills the law. Mm -hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to agree with everybody's opinion, agree with everybody's relational decisions, approve of everybody's political opinions, praise God. Um, (laughs) yeah, so on and so forth. Um, really to me, accepting people is acknowledging their reality. It's acknowledging their experiences in the moment. Um, you know, you, you can't walk a mile in somebody's shoes, but you can walk miles next to people. And I think that's what Jesus wants us to do in that situation. Why, why is it such a difficult thing for churches and church leadership to um, steward that well? Why is it so difficult? Because I'm just thinking, you know, and I'm not going to use my church, but I think other churches and people who I've talked to, um, you know, it's, you got to stand firm in the truth. You got to stand firm in the truth. And it almost becomes this like defense mechanism that isn't attractive because you're so firm and you're almost angry and you start preaching what is truth, but it doesn't come across in a way where it's like, wait a minute, that whole love your neighbor as yourself thing. That doesn't feel like that's coming out right now, even though you're speaking or preaching truth. Why is that so hard for so many in the church to cultivate that atmosphere? Like you just said of making people who are different or believe differently, or just straight from the LGBTQ community, why is that so hard for some churches to just grasp? I, I think I think for many different reasons, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll name two specifically. Number one, I think it's selfishness. I think hmm. that all of us have this really nasty condition that's going to kill us called sin. <laughs> that's yeah. why we're all going to die. And yep. there's no vaccine for that. There's no Tylenol. There's no Advil. Um, you know, now as Christians, we believe there is a resurrection and, you know, that that's a good thing. You know, I totally believe in that. Um, but you and I, as people who believe in Jesus, who have the Holy Spirit, we still at the same time have to fight this gravitational pull towards self inside of us. We all have this gravitational pull towards self yeah. and we have to fight that all the time. And so I think that, and I think it's easy to um, start getting involved in church, maybe even church leadership. And it's easy to start leveraging our faith for selfish purposes, leveraging our faith for preferences. So I think that's one reason. I think another reason is, is that people don't like to feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, I, I have this rubber band. And I do this illustration a lot where um, some churches are just all about the grace, but no truth. And it's like holding a rubber band by one side. Some churches are all about the truth, but no grace. And it's like holding a rubber band by the other side and it's weak and it's flimsy and there's no power there. So where's the power? If you say I'm about the grace and the truth, where's the power lie? The power Mm -hmm. lies in the tension of the two and tension's uncomfortable. That's why people are either all about the grace or all about the truth because it's spiritual laziness. It takes no effort on their part, no dependence on God to just be, you know, what you are, in the moment, like most of us are either all about the rules or all about the mercy. That's just kind of our personality, but it takes all the effort in the world to stretch over here. And we feel this tension when it's like, you know, God says this, 
we should live this way, but we're struggling with this in our lives. Or Jesus says you should treat people like this, but our friends are doing this. And Paul says this, and my family is making this decision. But there's a name for this tension that's love, that love is the tension that we feel between grace and truth. Mm. And love is uncomfortable. It's sacrificial. It's hard. When we run away from the tension, we're running away from love. But one of the, the second reason why I believe that churches and, and Christians really struggle with this is because they're spiritually lazy. They don't want to be uncomfortable. And Jesus said he would give us peace. He never said he would give us comfort. There's a big difference. Huge difference. Um, how's the response been since you've kind of, since you wrote Messy Grace, now Messy Truth, The God of Tomorrow is your second book, also a great book. But how has the response been when you tackle a topic like this, even having that topic be on this podcast? I think there might be some people who are uncomfortable with it. Um, like you said, that tension, but how has it been received for the most part when you have discussions about this in the church? Um, so far, it's been good. You know, it's I good. do a lot of consulting with churches and yeah. Christian colleges and seminaries and ministries. So, so far, it's been good. Um, there is always pushback. There are always people uh, coming from, for lack of a better word, both sides mm -hmm. firing arrows at you. Um, sure. But, you know, if, if, if people like you and me are going to live in that messy middle, that uncomfortable tension, we've got to learn to be a bridge. Because I think that false dichotomies, us versus them mentalities, you know, uh, either or mentality. I think that the, those false dichotomies are really ruling in our society today, in our culture. I think that a lot of people don't think you have a voice unless you are an extremist on one side or the other. <sighs> and so I, I just see some of these divides getting deeper, deeper and deeper by the, by just almost everything. So when we decide to live in that tension, we also act as a bridge. I think that living that messy middle, like being in that tension, we have to, we, we, we destroy the false dichotomies because we're like, with everything, it's not as simple as either or. Now, there are some absolute things I believe in Christianity, like I know you do. There is a God. He's triune in his nature. Yes. The Bible is inspired. Um, you know, the, there's a heaven and a hell. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Jesus Christ resurrected physically. He's coming back. I believe all those things. But there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of nuance in other areas that, again, not nuance to God, but nuance to us. Like the virgin birth, there's no tension there. Like the wrath of the lamb <laughs> or like God is all knowing, but allows, but holds us responsible for our decisions. The Bible is inspired, but written by sinful people. Um, you know, Jesus is fully God, fully human, grace and truth. Uh, death and evil were defeated at the cross and the resurrection, not yet destroyed. Um, you know, you can still have hair and look beautiful. I mean, I look at tension all we're throughout talking to our a bald man, by the way, for those yeah. listening on the podcast, we're talking to a very, very bald man in Caleb Kaltenbeck. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. beautiful bald bald. Man. My brother's yeah. bald. He's a beautiful bald man too. There so. you go. There are some people that can't pull off the ball. They have I indentations cannot. and everything. Yeah. And I get that. But the way that I look at it is that um, there are some things where we need to learn to engage the nuance. And it doesn't mean we don't have conversations. It doesn't mean we don't have opinions, but it means that we have to acknowledge the tension that does exist. There. Yeah. Well, I think people need to go get your book to messy truth, how to foster community without sacrificing conviction. It's uh, it's going to be, it's a great resource. It's going to be an incredible resource. I think for the church, um, you're an incredible resource as well. Cause I want people to know you do consulting. So if people uh, have questions or if you're in a church and you want to figure out like the best way, pick up Caleb's book and then hit him up on social and, and see if there's a way to connect and see if you can help you because um, he's helped me a lot. I know just in our friendship and in the books that he's written, I know he can help you as well. Um, I do want to end on a much lighter note um, because that's a heavy topic that we're just, we're just talking about there. So I want people to get the book. Um, hopefully they're encouraged by what you had to say. I know I have been, uh, but the last question I'm going to ask more of a fun question, um, kind of brings us back, you know, to the beginning full circle here. What is in your idea or what would be, and maybe you've already had this, but what would be the perfect sports day 
for Caleb Kaltenbach. The perfect sports day. Watching the Chiefs win the Super Bowl at Arrowhead Stadium. At Arrowhead Stadium, right. I don't think that can happen, but. I, that would be pretty well, you perfect. Didn't, you didn't say reality. No, you I said I, perfect. I, I've had people you said answer. Perfect. <laughs> I've had people answer that question uh, in a, in, a, in an alternate reality, right? Like the yeah. what if that you see in Marvel. Yeah, um, yeah, like the what if. Yeah, the multiverse. We're in a multiverse. we're in a different timeline. Right. I'm I'm creating variants of myself and everybody else. But <laughs> but I you know also I, I would say meeting Patrick Mahomes. Okay. You know, I've asked God for that several times. He hasn't okay. responded yet. Not Patrick Mahomes, God. You know what um, I did? Uh, I did get to do Caleb at the Super Bowl. Um, Sports Spectrum has been has, the NFL has been amazing in giving us credentials for the Super Bowl week leading up to the game. And mm-hmm. so we've been down to Atlanta. We were in Miami this year. We went to Tampa, even though nobody was really there. Um, and all of the interviews that were done were on Zoom, and you have to kind of join into this Zoom. And I, I remembered hearing about. Patrick Mahomes is like background. We, he, there was some faith there in that background. So I wanted to get in and try to ask him a question. And I thought there's no way that, you know, cause the NFL has to choose who gets to answer the question because it's done via zoom. And they, all of a sudden I'm watching Mahomes answer his questions and I'm kind of waiting in this order, hoping that I get a chance. And that all of a sudden I hear Jason Romano from sports spectrum, you're up next. And I was kind of caught off guard and I was like, Okay, let's go. Patrick, it's Jason Romano. And I asked him one question. I said, tell me about the importance of prayer and faith in your life. And he talked about it. It wasn't the the greatest answer in the world, but I got a little nervous. And I've been doing this for 25 years and got a little nervous that I got to ask the MVP uh, a question. So I know it's not meeting him, but, you know. Well, I mean, it kind of is. It's kind of close. Yeah, I have that on, you know, it's recorded. It's on our YouTube page and it's there forever. So I guess that's kind of a connection and you know no, that's me, a, that, so we're kind of close there's like a little connection yeah no no six degrees of separation and i could tell you know how when moses came off mount sinai and his eye his hair was white and people couldn't look at his face because it was glowing yes. i could tell there's something different about you and now that i know that you've you know patrick mahomes interacted with you yes. i can tell that that's it yeah that, that is the the countenance that you have right now was because of your interaction so it's not about my faith or sports spectrum no or you've Bucks. already had all that man okay you've okay. already had i'm saying the extra gotcha the extra yeah there there's extra right there the aura like, that's coming off of me right now is because oh, i talked to one, patrick mahomes no yeah it's kind of like yeah if you had talked to somebody from the raiders then you would <laughs> lose aura you would lose your countenance um I see what you did there yeah, if you talk to somebody from the Broncos. I just know. did a couple months ago. Yeah. Dalton See, Reisner. I know you can't root for the Broncos, but you can root for Dalton Reisner, offensive lineman. Yeah. On the yeah. Broncos, loves yeah. Jesus, has tattoos yeah. in Sports Spectrum's magazine right now. There's pictures of his tattoos that are all scripture. Um, so you can root for Dalton Reisner, the person, but he wears the wrong uniform. No, no, that's what I tell people all the time. You know, I will because I'm going to be in eternity with him. Like, I was at a church. I said something about the Chiefs. They booed me. They're just playing. And I said, "Look, you need a root for the Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes is a Christian, and you're going to be with him in eternity. Or who knows? Maybe you won't." <laughs> wow, Caleb just coming in hard right there, like an uppercut to the face. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was a bunch of students. I forgot this summer That's at a conference, like, like thousand students or whatever i'm like listen y'all need to clean up your attitude love your christian brother or else the love of christ is not in you turn and burn right turn or burn (laughs) altar call right now i feel it let's go wow oh that's such good stuff there caleb calton back i wish we could talk for hours my friend and we can at some point but for this podcast purposes um this has been a wonderful conversation thanks for coming on thanks for sharing your story thanks for writing messy truth Hopefully people go out and pick it up and uh, you're the best brother. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me, dude. It's been great. And many thanks to Caleb Calton back for joining us here today on sports spectrum. If you listen to the whole conversation, man, kudos to you. Cause we talked a lot about the chiefs, the NFL, Patrick Mahomes, star Wars, the Mandalorian Marvel. We talked a lot about things that really don't have anything to do with, with faith or Jesus, but if you made it through that, and I hope you did, if you like those things, then you obviously were interested in hopefully hearing what we had to say, but 
When we talked in the second half of this conversation about messy truth, about fostering community without sacrificing conviction, that was some powerful stuff there from Caleb Kaltenbach, and you need to go pick up his book. It's a really, really great resource. I've been mentioning it throughout the podcast, Messy Truth. His first book, Messy Grace, is also one you want to go pick up. And if you do, let me know. Uh, like I said, we can connect you with Caleb through his website. You can find him on social media, Caleb Cal, and just m message him that way. That's a great way to get in touch with him, but he's a great dude. And uh, I think the work that he's doing is so important and so vital, especially in the church. So thanks to Caleb for being here uh, today on Sports Spectrum. We also appreciate you for tuning in and listening. I would love to hear your feedback, good or bad. Uh, Jason at sportspectrum.com is my email, Jason at sportspectrum.com. And if you have a, a thought on what we talked about today, or maybe you're just a Star Wars fan or a Marvel fan, and you want to kind of go back and forth a little bit, feel free to email me, Jason at sportspectrum.com. On the way out, make sure you click that subscribe button so that you don't miss any episodes of what we're offering here at the Sports Spectrum podcast. You can listen to all of our conversations and all of the different podcasts that we have on the Sports Spectrum Podcast Network right at our website, sportspectrum.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time right here on the show. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.